Hi, my name is Juliana and I'm a language teacher and master in applied linguistics. And in this channel, I talk about different areas of linguistics and related subjects. So if you're interested in these topics, make sure to subscribe and let me know in the comments below if you have any suggestions. So today, let's talk about the key concepts in cognitive linguistics. And as always, I'm leaving all of the references that I've used for this video in the description box below, as well as timestamps. So first of all, there is a terminological detail here that I think is important to mention. In this video, I'm talking about cognitive linguistics with capitalized initials, because cognitive linguistics with non-capitalized initials is a broader term for any approach that views language as a mental phenomenon. Therefore, generative grammar is also part of the broader cognitive approach to linguistics. In fact, as I mentioned in my video about generative grammar, which I'm going to link probably here or somewhere, as I said in that video, generative grammar was considered a cognitive turn in linguistics, opposing behaviorism back then in the 1950s. And cognitive linguistics, with capitalized initials that we're going to talk about today, actually rose out of generative grammar when some linguists, especially George Lakoff, uh, disagreed with other generativists about semantics. The thing is that for generativists, language can be explained as a system of rules that generate sentences. So meaning is secondary to these rules, to the structure, meaning arises from structure. So syntax is analyzed without consideration to the context. But cognitive linguists say no, meaning comes first, and meaning also depends on the context and on the social interaction. So, for example, imagine that you are in a room close to the window, and the window is closed, and someone says, oh, it's hot in here. That sentence is not just an observation about the temperature, it's actually a request for you to open the window. But the meaning is not there in the structure, the meaning is in the context. And even if it were a question, for example, can you open the window? The structure of this question, can you, this is a question about ability. But in the context, that is not a question about ability, it is a request. So according to cognitive linguists, examples like that do not fit the generative idea that sentences are merely symbols put together following mathematical logic. Another key difference from generative grammar is that cognitive linguists don't work with the hypothesis that there is a language module in our minds with something like universal grammar guiding the acquisition and development of language. Cognitive linguists see language as something that can be acquired and explained in terms of general cognition. It's a description of language based on general cognitive processes, such as analogy, abstraction, categorization, and schema formation. A key aspect of cognitive linguistics is that, quote, Cognitive linguistics is not a single theory of language, but rather a cluster of broadly compatible approaches. So, for instance, we have cognitive grammar, construction grammar, word grammar. So, in this video, I'm focusing on semantics, but let me know in the comments below if you would like a video on the cognitive approaches to grammar in general. So, let's look at a few of the key concepts in cognitive linguistics. Let's start with metaphors, because Cognitive linguistics started with the study of metaphors back in the 1970s. And in 1980, Lakoff and Johnson published a very influential book called Metaphors We Live By. You may have learned that a metaphor is a linguistic convention in which words are used with a different meaning, usually in literature or poetry. But for cognitive linguistics, Metaphors are not just mere linguistic conventions, but patterns of conceptual association. It means we understand some things in terms of another thing. For example, how do we normally talk about love relationships in English? Let's imagine if you want to say that you are having trouble in your relationship. 
You may say things such as we've hit a dead end street or we are at a crossroads, we are going in different directions or our marriage is on the rocks as if it were a boat. We are off track or we are spinning our wheels as if the relationship was a car that was stuck. So you see all of these expressions, they are actually originally used to talk about a journey, difficulties with a vehicle in a journey. So we think of love relationships as if they were a journey or a vehicle and the lovers are travelers. We use words from one domain, the source domain, in this case journey or traveling, and we project them or map them onto the target domain, in this case love relationships. And these are not just random cases, this is a system. Some other common examples are uh, we talk about arguments as if we were talking about war. Uh, we can say that we want an argument, that we attack or defend positions. Another very common example, time is money. So we can save, spend, invest, waste time as if it were money. So the metaphors are not in the words. The metaphors come from this process of mapping. So metaphors aren't simply words being used in an unusual way. And in fact, they are extremely usual. In cognitive linguistics, they are called conceptual metaphors. So we reason about one domain based on another. Metaphor is a normal mode of thought. The embodiment hypothesis is basically the idea that language is grounded in our physical experience. Let's use some orientational metaphors to illustrate that. So orientational metaphors uh, basically use spatial orientation. For example, up and down metaphors. Normally we say that more is up and less is down. For example, prices rise or salaries rise and fall. And this seems to be based on our experience. For example, if we add things to a pile, the level goes up. If we take things off the pile, then the level goes down. Normally, we associate happiness with up. So I'm feeling up, my spirits rose. And we associate sadness with down. So I'm feeling down or he fell into a depression. And there seems to be a physical reason for this, because when we are happy, we are healthy, feeling good, we have a more erect position. Whereas if we are feeling sad, we are going to have more of a drooping posture, right? And if you're ill, you're going to be lying down. So it seems that we use words from a more uh, concrete or embodied uh, domain to talk about more vague abstract domains such as emotions or relationships and time as I said before. Research has shown that it seems to be the case that in all languages metaphors draw on bodily experience but not necessarily on the same experience. This will vary among cultures. For example, in English, normally we see the future as something that is ahead of us and the past is something that is behind us, as if life was a journey and so the past is behind us and we are walking into the future. But some cultures think the opposite. In some languages, the past is talked about as something that is in front of you because you know the past, so you can see it, right? Because you, you know it, you remember it. Whereas the future, you don't know yet, so you can't see it, so it's behind you. So prototype theory is a theory of how we categorize the world through language. And that's very important because categorization is a very basic cognitive ability. So before we talk about prototype theory, let's remember the classic theory of categories that says that a category has a necessary and sufficient set of features as if it were a checklist 
of features that something needs to have in order to be part of the category and something is either in or out of a category. So for example, a square. So for something to be in the category of squares, it has to be um, a plain figure, it has to have four equal sides and four right angles, but not all concepts are like that, so that doesn't work very well for concepts that have degrees. For example, the concept tall. You can be very tall or not so tall, relatively tall. What is tall also depends on the culture because there are populations that are shorter than others, so what is considered tall in a country won't be considered in another maybe. So you see it's a gray area. You are not in or out of the category of tall, it depends. So prototype theory uh, started in the 1970s when Eleanor Roche studied the internal structure of categories. And she noticed that even when a category has clear boundaries, we still can talk about better or worse examples of members of that category. For example, the category of bird. That's a well-defined category. We know what is and isn't a bird. So, for example, a bat looks like a bird, but it's not because it's a mammal. And yet, there are some birds that are more bird-like than others. For example, a robin is more bird-like than, say, a penguin or a pelican. So, we say that a robin is the prototypical bird. And of course, which bird is the prototypical bird is going to vary from culture to culture. The prototypical anything of any category is going to vary according to culture. So the further that something is from the prototype of the category, the harder it will be for us to identify that as a member of that category. And this has been shown through experiments. So people actually took longer to say that a pelican is a bird than to say that a robin is a bird. So it seems that categories are organized around prototypes and not around features that the members need to have. So these are the concepts that I think that are the most basic among the key concepts in cognitive linguistics. There are many others, of course, but I didn't want this video to be very long. So thank you for watching, and if this video was useful for you, please share it as it helps my channel grow. And don't forget to like and subscribe, and I'll see you in the next video. Bye!